Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're taking the software drag racing series to the next level with some hardcore multi-core action. We're bringing out the big iron to test the raw, no excuses speed of Linux versus Windows. It'll be a brutal head-to-head -head showdown on the same hardware with no quarter asked, none given. We'll be doing our testing on the big Threadrippers, and not only am I going to compare the raw, real-world performance between the operating systems, I'm also going to test the four most popular compilers, so you'll also know how Visual C compares to GCC and CLang in their generated code performance. Join me today as we create a scorching new Primes benchmark that will truly let us unleash the beast within today's most powerful CPUs. If single-core CPU performance is analogous to traditional drag racing with a single engine, then multi-core processors are closer to the unlimited tractor pulls with their massive multi-engine rigs. This is our third episode in the software drag racing series. If you haven't seen the other two yet, tell your assistant to hold your calls for half an hour because you're in for a treat. Our first episode pitted Python versus C Sharp and C++, and C++ emerged the clear winner. Now, even Python can be made reasonably performant if you use a library such as NumPy to help with bit twiddling, but in the end, I decided to standardize on C++, due not only to its high speed but because of its wide acceptance across a broad range of systems. Plus, it's my native tongue. All of the testing to date has revolved around running a prime sieve whose job it is to find the prime numbers under 1 million. It does that as many times as it can in 5 seconds and the number of completed passes becomes its score. For some rough comparison, a Raspberry Pi scores in the 500 range while a relatively modern PC scores around 5000. On these bigger machines, we'll be running the sieve out to 10 million and then a billion instead of just 1 million, so just a heads up, you can't compare numbers from this episode to previous ones because of that. Everything we've done so far, however, has been single core work. It does one thing at a time, as fast as it can, and it repeats it as many times as it can in a row within the 5 seconds. While one core of your CPU is working feverishly away at maximum speed, all the other cores are just sitting idly by watching the show. Single core performance may not be as sexy as the numbers you get out of a massively parallel epic chip, but single core performance is still what determines how snappy a machine feels. That's because single core performance is really what determines how long it takes to complete any given task. Multi core performance is indicative of how many of those tasks can be completed all at once. If some complicated task takes 30 seconds to complete and it cannot be broken down any further such that it's truly a single core workload, then it doesn't matter how many cores you have, you're not going to get an answer back for 30 seconds. A great example of single core work can be found in most video games. While additional cores can help a game like Flight Simulator render more terrain more quickly by doing that in parallel, certain things are simply dependent on one another. That is to say you can't do A and B at the same time if starting work on B requires the results out of A first. You have to finish A before you can take the results and put them into B and even start on B, so putting them on separate cores would buy you nothing. And the chain of events where A provides results to B, which are then used by C and so on, is called the critical path. Let's say your critical path takes 20 milliseconds to process. Your maximum frame rate is then 50 frames per second. Adding more cores doesn't speed up the frame rate, it only allows additional work to be done alongside the critical path. To go back to my analogy earlier, more cores will allow you to do additional work, but they don't speed up the work that you already have to do unless you can somehow break that work up into parallel chunks. Some problems lend themselves easily to parallelization. For example, take a game like chess, where the computer has to evaluate the possible moves for each piece on the chessboard. Given the state of the board, the possible moves for each piece can be evaluated entirely separately from one another. The computer can run off and score the possible moves for the bishop and the possible moves for the queen on two different cores and then compare the results when they're ready. That should, in theory, be about twice as fast as doing it one after the other. What about our prime sieve? Well, it turns out that solving primes is somewhere in between and winds up fairly hard to effectively make parallel. The reasons become apparent once you really understand how the prime sieve algorithm works, so let's revisit the algorithm for a moment to refresh ourselves on how it operates. First, we write a list of all the numbers up to our limit that we want to consider. Next, we look for the first number that has not been eliminated from that list of possible primes. We circle it as a prime and then run through the list eliminating all of its subsequent multiples because anything that has that number as a factor other than itself is by definition not a prime number. 
so we crossed them off the list. Rinse and repeat. We keep looking for the next prime and limiting all of its multiples until we've reached the square root of our upper limit. And at that point we're done, and what's left in our list are all prime numbers. The problem with trying to parallelize this algorithm is that the elimination of the multiple step depends entirely on the finding of the next prime factor step. There's no way around that. You might be tempted to simply spin off the marking of the multiples onto its own thread. That, however, is a recipe for disaster because it would introduce a subtle bug. Consider the case where, for whatever reason, our scanning for primes goes first or faster than the elimination of the multiples which is running on a separate thread. It could find a number that should have been eliminated as a multiple and erroneously accepted as a prime simply because the elimination hasn't happened because it's running behind on the scanning thread. It can be a tough one to catch in the debugger if that happens. These two steps are then essentially a critical path, but perhaps one or both of those steps can be internally parallelized. I'm pretty confident that because it's impossible to predict how far away the next prime is with any certainty, there's not much to be gained from trying to break up the scanning for the next factor pass. It's probably more overhead than it'd be worth. But what about the elimination of the multiples from the list? That's where I focused my energy based on my thinking that the elimination of the multiples of the number 3 involves some 3 million steps in a sieve of 10 million. I figured that would be worth splitting up for sure. What I did then was to break up the range into batches of a certain size. I decided that each thread would process batches of 10,000 multiples, for example, then thread A would mark off all the multiples of 5 between 0 and 50,000. Thread B would mark off all the multiples from 50,000 to 100,000. That allows you to run 20 threads in parallel, each marking off a small section of the multiples. I varied how big that batch was by hand in order to optimize as best I could. And it all worked, it just really wasn't any faster. I tweaked the batch size and special case and small factors, but somewhat to my surprise, the overhead of creating and scheduling extra threads simply wasn't worth the win from parallelization in this case. My guess is that there are only a few small factors. By the time you're at the number 100, the batches are small enough that only a single core can really be used anyway. I scratched my head for a while, read a few papers on the subject, but at the end of the day, I couldn't make the process significantly faster unless the sieve size was very, very large. If you are scanning for the primes up to 10 billion, marking the multiples of 3 clearly benefits from multiple cores. But when you're only talking about going up to 1 million, the thread overhead seems to about offset any benefit. Having invested an hour or so into it and having come up empty, I'd be mighty impressed if somebody could come up with a readable parallel version without a bunch of special cases that actually outperforms a single threaded sieve to 1 million. Check it in. It turns out, however, that I was in a sense barking up the wrong tree. If the goal is to benchmark how much work a modern CPU can do in a short period of time, parallelizing the algorithm is but only one approach. After all, when you're doing thousands of passes per second, why not simply schedule those passes on different cores? And so that's precisely what I did. I looked around for some code that I could steal that would do sieves in parallel, but I'll let you in on a secret. I'm a bit of a lazy dude. Everything I found was complicated. Producer, consumer patterns with mutexes and deadlock prevention and all kinds of the sort of C++ template madness that keeps me awake at night. I figured if the goal is to keep all your cores as busy as possible, just create one thread per core and keep each core entirely consumed with cranking out passes of the prime sieve. Keep track of how many passes get done across all the cores in your 5 second burst and you've got your result. The beauty of this simple approach is that it's only a few lines of code and the sieve itself doesn't change at all. First, I need to know how many cores your CPU has, and so that's how I know how many threads to create. My 3970X reports 64, and it has 32 hyper-threaded cores. The 3990X chip, however, also reports 64. I'm not sure if that's a bug in the C runtime, or a feature, or a limitation of a single NUMA node, but the CRT doesn't guarantee that this number matches the hardware. The documentation says that it is merely guidance. That's why, in the end, I wound up adding a command line switch to let you plainly specify how many worker threads you actually want. Without going too far down the CPU architecture rat hole, it's worth noting that this algorithm really stresses the CPU memory cache. In a traditional architecture, all the cores share the same cache, so it just works. With chips like the AMD Threadripper, however, the cores are broken up into groups of 8 and they share L2 and L3 cache. As you might imagine, there's a lot of magical plumbing that goes on to keep each CPU's view of memory consistent with one another when every group of 8 has its own independent cache. After all, perhaps one core off in another group is marking a multiple that another core in another CPU group is about to read. Each needs a consistent view of memory and simply cannot trust what's in its own cache. This all happens deep within the CPU, well below the level that we program at, but it has real-world implications for speed and performance. One of those implications is that creating threads is also not free. I rely on a one thread per sieve approach, and I figure the amount of work to compute the primes to 10 million likely justifies the overhead of creating and destroying one thread. 
After adding the code to run the sieves in parallel and the ability to specify how many threads to run for the command line, I then compiled and built the exact same C++ program four different ways. With Visual C++ for Windows, with the C-Line compiler for Windows, with GCC for Linux, and then finally with the C-Line compiler for Linux. Not only do I think this will tell us a lot about the code performance we get out of the various compilers, but the fact that I'm going to be able to compare C-Line generated code directly between Windows and Linux makes that comparison much more of an apples to apples comparison. It should, at least in theory, eliminate much of the variation from the compiler and truly let us compare the operating systems. My first approach was to run it from the command line and then copy and paste the results into an Excel chart. Well, that turned out to be way too tedious, especially if you consider they had to do at least 64 cases for a minimum of four compilers and OS variations. So my next step was to write a simple Python program to launch the benchmark repeatedly and while increasing the thread count from 1 to 64. I added a command line option to quiet down the program and output such that it produced only the timings. The Python script captures the info from the standard out and prints the results in a nice table that I can copy and paste straight into Excel. Once I've got all the data in an Excel, I can graph it, which will reveal a great deal. So let's have a look. As we can immediately see, the Visual C compiler's implementation lags the rest by about 10%. I took a brief look at the generated code, and the biggest difference seems to be the GCC and CLang treat the sieve memory as blocks of 64 bits rather than 32. The assembly code from VC shifts the index by 5, whereas GCC and CLang plainly shift it by 6. I don't actually believe this is due to better code generation, but rather the way in which the supplied runtime implements the vector of bools. That's up to the compiler vendor, and if we look at the visual C++ code, we can drill down through vector bool and see that it has the constant v bits, which turns out to be 8 bits per byte times the number of bytes in the base type, and the base type it uses here is an unsigned int. That's a 32-bit type instead of a 64-bit type, and I have a hunch that perf would improve with a change to a 64-bit base type. After all, the system registers a 64-bit, and that's worth doing all its masking. If we look at the assembly language for a generated code in the two cases, we can see that C-Line generates slightly different and more efficient code than VC when it comes to clearing out every nth bit. Check out the C-Line implementation and compare that to the more naive and literal Visual C approach that loads a register from memory, clears it out with the BTR instruction, and then stores it back. I haven't counted cycles by hand or anything yet, but I'm fairly certain that this is where the difference comes in between them. And finally, to answer the big question of which operating system is faster, the answer is that it's going to depend on the CPU you're using. In terms of desktop, it appears that C-Lang for Windows is the absolute fastest by a thin margin up until about 14 cores are running. But if you have more cores than that fully engaged, then not only does Linux start to pull ahead at that point, but it makes an absolute leap at about the 16 CPU mark. This is something I can't explain, and I'd love to hear your theories. Is Linux being smart about pooling threads rather than creating additional ones beyond a certain point? Even so, it wouldn't account for the sudden bump, nor the subsequent contraction back at around 32 CPUs. I don't have access to any high-core Xeons to see if they behave similarly, but the code is all in the GitHub repository. If there's sufficient interest, I can also likely put up a binary for those of you who don't know how or perhaps just don't want to compile your own. It'll give you something to test with, but just zipped up. I don't want to do a fancy setup and everything yet for it. Let me know if that is something that you want to see. My hunch was a simple one, and that was that Threads are simply heavier weight on Windows. I think my benchmark may actually be a degenerate case for Windows because it simply creates too many threads. But how many threads is too many? Each sieve launches on its own thread, and my feeling was that running a sieve out to about 10 million would be enough work to justify the life and death of a thread. But once you get a lot of cores running on a big CPU, that amounts to thousands of threads per second, which is not an efficient approach. The compiler could be smarter for me, or I could be smarter for my own sake. To find out if there was any merit, I did a simple test. I made the sieve a simple no-op so that I was merely creating and destroying threads about as fast as I could. And sure enough, Windows was about the same speed and doing almost no work, meaning that a lot of its time had in fact been spent in thread overhead. It's time to take a look at the final results. Each compiler and OS put to maximum load, generating sieves up to 1 billion. Test Manager confirms in each case that the CPU is in fact fully loaded. Since we know that only about one thread per second is being created on average for the one billion case, thread creation overhead shouldn't matter here, but the context switch efficiency of the operating system does. That's a measure of how seamlessly it can share the CPU amongst the 64 busy threads without wasting too many cycles on logic and bookkeeping and so on. There's a book I keep on my bookshelf that I'll link to in the description, and it's called How to Lie with Statistics. It's a good book, but I just like to have it on my bookshelf for how it looks and everyone likes to thumb through it. In it, you learn handy tricks such as where to set the origin of your chart axis. Consider this example. 
Here are those final results for the sieves up to 1 billion. With the origin based at zero, it looks like they're all about the same. And in one sense they are because the difference really is only a few percent, and you still don't really see it. But if we zoom into the chart by pulling the origin all the way up to 0.9, we can make it look like Linux absolutely trounced Windows by focusing on just the very top of the chart where it turns out that Linux ekes out a 3% win over Windows. Where the chart should really be drawn is a matter of some journalistic integrity, but since that doesn't apply to me, I'll just put it where it looks about right visually, which is a 0.75. Drag racing is often decided by hundreds or even thousands of a second, and this case is no exception. Thinnest of margins or not, the official win for number crunching primes of performance goes today to Linux. <coughs> Don't forget to sub for future rounds in the Linux vs Windows Showdown. If you enjoyed this round of the Showdown, please be certain to leave me a thumbs up and to make sure you're subscribed to the channel. I'm still trying to figure out the right balance between coding and exposition and your subscriptions in large part determine where I focus my time. If I see a bunch of new subscriptions from a particular video, then I know I'm going in the right direction. I'll then make more like it, and if you turn on the bell icon, you'll even be notified of them when I do. It's a win-win. And don't forget to grab your Dave's Garage mug, which is guaranteed to make your coffee actually taste better. Not a guarantee. And besides, all profits from mug sales will go to autism research, and you probably need a mug anyway, so why not own a mug that's cool and helped out a kid? Besides the mugs, however, I'm not selling anything and I don't have any Patreons. I'm just in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be sure appreciative if you left me one of each before you left. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. It's worth noting that this algorithm really stretches the CPU memory cache. Ah, no, stresses. Well, it could stretch it, I guess, if it were a liberty. Producer consumer patterns with mutexes and deadlock prevention and all kinds of the sort of C++ template, template madness. Template. Tempate. This. Everything I found was pretty complicated. Producer consumer patterns with mutexes and deadlock prevention and all kinds of a sort of C template. Temp if you're scanning for the primes up to 10 billion, marking the multiples of three. Oh, so thirsty. And so refreshing for my Dave Garage Mug.